Enkki. Nitaniku Enkki. In the Blackfoot language, Enkki means singer. So that's my name in Blackfoot, singer. But my government name is Grant Manyheads. And I'm one of the interpreters here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park. And today we're going to be talking about Blackfoot history. In particular, uh, our lands uh, since time immemorial to today. And we're going to kind of talk about how that huge, vast territory that the Blackfoot used to encompass at one point, how it has kind of whittled down to the reserves that we have today. So we're going to kind of discuss a little bit of that sort of history. So starting from about after the signing of the treaty up until 1910 land surrender, we're going to try and touch on some of these subjects as we go along with this history lesson. So first, I like to talk about Niitawasi. Now basically, that means that was how the Blackfoot called our land. That, that land which we considered our territory was Niitawasi. So Niitawasi basically means that we are the people of the land of the buffalo. So ancient stories, our ancient stories as Blackfoot people place us in different parts of our vast territory. So if you take a look at that map, you can actually kind of see in the darkened yellow, those areas that were sacred to the Blackfoot people. So all along the foothills of the mountains, we had sacred sites. We had places such as uh, Chief Mountain and uh, Crow's Nest Mountain, as they called it. Well, these two mountains go back into the origins of the Blackfoot people. And if you go a little bit further north and you come to the Old Man's River, and some of you may have visited the place, it's really a beautiful part of the foothills, and that's where the Old Man's Playing Ground is. Just in an area they call the Gap of the Old Man's River as it comes from the mountains. And this entire area, these areas were considered sacred by the Blackfoot people. If you go north up into the Banff area, or these were holy springs, the Blackfoot people considered these holy springs. And these, these uh, places were all part of the Blackfoot stories that we have to this day regarding where we got um, the rights to be here, to live here on the land, to, to coexist with the other living creatures that lived here as well. So all over the Blackfoot territory, we had sacred sites and we have stories to reflect this. So many ancient stories, many, many ancient stories reflect the many sacred sites that we have in our vast territory. So instead of calling it like former Blackfoot territory, we still look at this as our territory. This was a territory given to us by Itzabeta Biopa, or by Apastidogi, uh, by the creator, the essence of life. This land was given to our people to hunt the buffalo. Ini. So let's look at the next image here. Here we have the Sixigaitzita Peaks, or the Blackfoot-speaking peoples. These are the four tribes that exist today. And in English, I guess you can translate that to Blackfoot Confederacy. Well, the four tribes are Siksika, that's where we are right now on the Blackfoot Crossing. And then to the south of us are Agena. Uh, they have the biggest reserve in Canada. And then we have Amskapi Pikani, and that's in the United States of America. And then we have Apadusi Pikani, here in Canada, near Brockett. So these four tribes, these four different uh, nations, make up the Blackfoot-speaking peoples today, the Blackfoot Confederacy. So the, we're going to be mostly relating to these three tribes or these four tribes when we talk about our history as we go back at some point because all these tribes were all pretty much spoke the same language, had the same customs, had the same beliefs, etc. And we were united by our language. So let's move on to the next image actually here. <clears throat> so yeah, it's the buffalo, Ini. Wherever the great northern herds roamed, our people, Sixigaiti, the peaks, we followed them wherever the buffalo went. So our territory was defined by the buffalo. We didn't go past the North Saskatchewan because you're going into bushland now. Now you're going into like Aspen uh, parkland. And the buffalo, although they did go into those regions, they didn't stay there. They were prairie animals. They ate the grass, basically the grasses that they had on the prairies. This is, was the buffalo food. So they only moved throughout the prairies. And wherever they went throughout the prairies, the Blackfoot bands would follow them and we would hunt. So this area that you see on this image, this is the Blackfoot territory, basically our hunting grounds, our homeland. 
This is what we considered our homeland. So you can kind of see how vast that was. You can see the Rocky Mountains on the one side there. And then you could actually see how far, about 300 miles or so, it goes out into like the Touchwood Hills and the Kapal Valley in present day Saskatchewan. So this was a huge area. And, and as I mentioned, this is all prairie. This is all plains. So the buffalo wandered throughout this entire region and we followed them throughout this entire region. So our people would have as much as literally hundreds of bands. It would, it, we're talking about the entire Blackfoot Confederacy, all four bands. And these bands would be moving, for all four tribes I should say, and bands from those tribes would be moving all throughout our country, throughout our territory, on every waterway. They would be hunting buffalo, going to different kill sites, crisscrossing, meet, meeting up with each other, banding together in huge camps, then breaking apart for the hunts. There was a, a lot of Blackfoot people then. So we have, as, as a number, we really can't put a number on it. But the thing is, there are guesstimates from 200 some thousand people to even half a million that may have lived on the plains that were Blackfoot speaking people at some point. And then over time, this population was slowly reduced. So that's a pretty vast area. So let's go move on to the next image. Okay, so this kind of tells us where our boundaries were. So our territory as Blackfoot people extended from the North Saskatchewan River. So if you look on that map, you're looking at Edmonton, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, yeah, all these ones up north there. All of these towns on the North Saskatchewan, this was the farthest north of the Blackfoot territory, as far as our homeland goes, as I mentioned. Because when you go north of there, then you get into uh, bush country, you get into uh, the woodlands. So from there, all the way south, down to the Yellowstone River, which is in present day Montana, kind of like towards Wyoming. But the Yellowstone River was like the southern boundary of the Blackfoot territory, because this was all prairie as well, and, and mountains, foothills, all sorts, but this was uh, the Blackfoot hunting grounds. So from the Rocky Mountains, and the Blackfoot called it the backbone of the world. Well, from the backbone of the world, all the way east to Kapal Valley and the Touchwood Hills and just east of Reg present day Regina. Well, this is all prairie country, as I mentioned. So all this country, the Blackfoot considered their hunting grounds. Now, the thing is, you know, what's interesting is the Blackfoot were just, we were mostly concentrated in this region that we're looking at right now. But if you look at the history books, all along the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, the Blackfoot have gone all the way down as far as Santa Fe, as, we far, as far as we know it to Taos, New Mexico, all in that area. And that's because they were following what they call the Old North Trail. A lot of people don't even know that this trail existed, but this was a trail that um, kind of was a uniform distance of about 100 miles east of the foothills as it followed the Rocky Mountains going north-south or south-north. But this Old North Trail, many tribes used it over the centuries, over the thousands of years this trail has been used. So it's, it was well marked. While a lot of these tribes who, who followed this trail south, the Blackfoot followed it as well. And they went all the way down back around 1830, even as far back as the 1800s. They were going all the way down to Santa Fe to look for horses, to steal from the Spanish settlements and places like that. And they even uh, account of seeing slaves, Negro slaves, in the fields working for these people. And so the Blackfoot people have been very far south, and a lot of them intermarried or they lived with a lot of other tribes such as the uh, Cheyenne and the Arapaho up on the Platte River, North Platte River. And in fact, we were actually down there quite a bit. I think we had a lot of relations, but this was over the years. So there's Blackfoot people who were all on the eastern slopes of the mountains. And, and like I mentioned, our population, it was unknown. We could have uh, interacted with a lot of other tribes. So let's look at the next image actually. So our people believe that this territory, as I mentioned earlier, and all the resources in it had been given as a gift to us by the Creator. So other tribes, they were welcome to come and visit and trade, but not to take our game or our resources without our permission. And usually that would involve a parlay where you would sit down and you would make a peace of sorts and allow a tribe that usually doesn't hunt on your grounds to come in and hunt on your grounds for a brief period so, and then they would have to go back where they came from. But you would clearly let them know that this was our hunting grounds as Blackfoot people. 
So over the centuries, our, the different bands amongst our Sixigeti Tepiks, they developed the habit of living in different parts of our territory. So if we look at the next image, you can kind of see that disbursement here. Now this map would have been circa 1840, 1850. This is kind of how the, uh, the boundaries of the Siksika people would have been. It wouldn't have been as further east because by this time, a lot of diseases had actually taken place. At least four or five big diseases had already whittled down the population of the Blackfoot people from 1765 right up until about 1810 there was five different epidemics that took out huge swaths, literally thousands and thousands of Blackfoot. Every time one of these diseases hit, thousands of Blackfoot people would die. And then the next one would come and take out another, literally thousands of people. So by this time, our population had really decreased, about 1840, 1850. But yet we were still hunting the buffalo in that area of uh, what you see in Alberta. So. Usually the, uh, the Siksika always camped east and north of our vast territory. This was our hunting grounds. And so that would have been up around the Battle River and the Red Deer River, going out to the Hand Hills, all the way out to the Buffalo Hills, uh, just below um, Fort Pitt, what they would have called it, or even up near the border there beside Onion Lake and uh, Saddle Lake. So the Siksika, we were usually found up in the North Saskatchewan all the way kind of east from there. The Gaina, they lived in the central part. So even where Blackfoot Crossing is today, this would have been more of their hunting grounds. Uh, Calgary, all the way up to the Red Deer, all the way to Medicine Hat, and this whole area, and of course into the United States of America, present day United States of America. So, and then the Begani, they would camp more towards the foothills, towards the mountain, and they would camp all along the foothills all the way down to the Yellowstone area. So, and in this time there used to be a band called the Anuxics. Now I think they're a part of the Bikani. But at that time they were huge enough to kind of be considered their own band. And they kind of moved into that area, uh, the su most southern part of the Blackfoot territory, even going on to the other side of the mountains on the western slope, especially where the Bitterroot Valley is in near present day Missoula and into the Flathead Valley. The Blackfoot actually moved into, Blackfoot speaking peoples moved into these areas. So the Blackfoot lived in, in this vast, vast area that you can actually see on the map. So let's move on to the next image. Now we're coming to 1877. Now 1877, of course we know, was a pivotal year because this is when the Blackfoot speaking peoples signed treaty with the government of Canada or the Queen's representatives. So that happened on September 21st, 22nd of 1877. As you can see here, and there's uh, Governor Laird uh, sitting on his chair and addressing him as uh, Chief Crowfoot of the Siksika people. So at this time, there was two bands of Siksika. There was the North and the South Siksika, and Crow Chief Crowfoot was actually the head of the Southern Siksika bands, and Old Son was head of the Northern Siksika bands at that time. So after the signing of Treaty Number 7, as it turns out, this is how the government surveyed the lands. So you see that yellow part. Now this yellow part is apparently what the Blackfoot surrendered for Treaty 7 to exist. And for us to get what we have today, the uh, arrangement we have with the federal government, with the representatives of the Queen, this apparently is the land that the Blackfoot and the other two tribes surrendered. Now what's funny is because this land here, had the Blackfoot not signed it, and there was no Treaty 7, it would just read unoccupied lands because these borders were already drawn up long before they came to the Blackfoot people. And that's a bona fide fact because Treaties 4 and Treaty 6 were both um, uh, negotiated years before the government ever treated with the Blackfoot people. So the Blackfoot people have always had discrepancy regarding these borders. They were never chosen by us. These were chosen by the government and by enemy tribes at that time, 1877. So, and those tribes would have came from Treaty 6 and Treaty 4. So if we look at this, here's another image of uh, Treaty 7. So you can kind of see where the Treaty 6 area covers and then the Treaty 4. And as I mentioned, all the tribes in both of these, Treaty 6 and Treaty 4, at that time were enemies with the Blackfoot. And those tribes treated with the uh, federal government 
or the Queen's representatives uh, a year and three years before they ever met with the Blackfoot people. So the Treaty 7 boundaries were drawn up before uh, we even signed treaty. So once we signed treaty, well, now those are Treaty 7 surrendered lands. And so these are the lands apparently that the Blackfoot people surrendered. But if you remember from the earlier maps, well, the Blackfoot territory extended past Saskatoon, past Regina, kind of where my hand is area up into Yorkton. So even during the signing of Treaty Number no. 7, the, there are still Blackfoot people that were living up on the, what do you call that, elbow of the South Saskatchewan River. So there's always been discrepancy as to the borders of Treaty Number no. 7. But let's move on to the next image. Here we have another picture of Treaty Number no. 7, Treaty 6 beside it, and then Treaty 4 to the, to the west, or east, sorry. Okay, now we're going to go to 1879, and we're going to kind of do this between here and 1910, because uh, we're just going to look at some key events, even though there's a lot of history, an incredible amount of history between the time of the signing of treaty right up until the 1900s. So let's take a look at 1879. Well, in 1879, disease and starvation, they forced the Blackfoot people to follow the last buffalo herds to Montana. So literally in 1879, all the Sixty the Beaks, they all left the British territories and mostly all of them went down to the Judith Basin in Montana. And this is where there are still plenty of buffalo and they were hunting them. But in, in no time, these herds were basically thinned out or wiped out as well. So disease, starvation, our people as uh, Sixty Ga people uh, under Crowfoot, we were there down, we were down in the Judith Basin for two years during this time. And you know what's funny is both times at the um, both times after the signing of the treaty in 1878 and 1879, when the Blackfoot people went to the government for help, they were uh, basically given provisions uh, for like three days travel and sent back to the United States. Even though they had the money at the time, they wouldn't uh, spend it on the Blackfoot. They wanted to save it, so they send the Blackfoot uh, southward, and the Sixiga people end up going to the Judith Basin, and. Uh, that wasn't, uh, that was all based on survival. So if we look at the next image, we jump to 1881. Well, basically by 1881, this was the extirpation of the buffalo, or ye and me. Uh, extirpation is basically a big word meaning almost brought to extinction. So this is what happened to the buffalo. And you can see that by these piles of buffalo bones that they started to send down east. This was probably around 1914 or so during the First World War. But they would use the bones from the buffalo, the phosphate, uh, basically for fertilizer, bleaching fertilizer, or for munitions, whatever it is that they were using it for. But all the millions of buffalo bones that were littered throughout the prairies were all gathered up because now they could uh, get a few bucks for them by the ton. And they would ship them on these rail cars and ship them down east. Uh, for munitions or fertilizer. And this is what happened to the, basically to the buffalo. They were almost brought to extinction. So with the last of these buffalo herds, there was no reason for the Blackfoot people to be in the States anymore. And even by this time, the people that settled in the United States, especially in Montana, they didn't want the Northern natives in their country, so to speak. So they forced them. They forced a lot of these natives that were living in the British possessions to go back to those places. So this is what the Blackfoot ended up doing, which was probably a good thing because the whole time that they were down in the Judith Basin, uh, hunting buffalo, they were mixed up with a bunch of other tribes that went down there for the same reason to hunt the buffalo. So the Sixiga actually lived with the Blood tribes and with Bikani tribes, but other than that, and uh, Tutena tribe, but other than those allies and friends, they had Crow and Groven and Cree and other tribes that were all camped in the same area, including the Sioux under Sitting Bull's people. And with all these natives, it was amazing that there was no open warfare for that period of time. There would be the odd horse stealing here and there. And it wasn't until after like two years that that kind of started to happen. But by this time, the buffalo were gone. So people were being forced back to their reserves. So this is what was happening in 1881. So at this time, the Blackfoot returned back to Canada and with no buffalo and no food, they were starving. So literally they say just amongst the Siksika people alone that 1,100 Siksika ones died on that trek from the Judith Basin from Montana all the way back to Fort McLeod, a few provisions, and then to Blackfoot Crossing. 
Why Blackfoot Crossing? Is because Blackfoot Crossing, because of the treaty, had a ration house. This was a place where the Blackfoot could go to get food, to get flour, to get a pound of meat per person, and they could survive because other than the odd game, deer, antelope, or some other animals around, which were pretty scarce even by that time, the only place where the Blackfoot could get food was at the ration house. And this was all because of the signing of Treaty Number no. 7. Uh, even after Treaty Number no. 7, there was still uh, elderly and infirm people who were staying near the ration house. The government can handle these infirm and sick ones. Uh, with the rations but it's when the Blackfoot came back on mass with all the population that they found that they couldn't meet and so they started giving inferior rations and rations that uh, were so cut down that as to not even stop starvation amongst the Blackfoot people but as I mentioned the Blackfoot crossing especially on the south on the north side of the Blackfoot crossing this is where the ration house like in this image you can see here and this is where we were forced to go to survive. So in 1883, there was a lot of things that kind of happened after this year. So now we've actually been on our reserve and we've been moving back to the Siksika. But you got to remember that the original signing of the treaty in 1977, all the Siksika Titipiks and their ally, the Tutina people, were all supposed to live on one huge, vast reserve. And this reserve was supposed to pretty much start from around Carsland area today, all the way down to uh, where the Red Deer meets the Bow River. Now this is a vast area and this was, this was to include the Siksika, the Gaina, Bigani, and the Tsutina people. Well, in 1883, it was decided by the different tribes by that time and encouraged by the government, I might add, that they should separate. This was totally against the wishes of Chief Crowfoot who wanted to keep all the Blackfoot and their allies together to show that we were a military force still that had to be dealt with because of our numbers. But after this time, the Bloods chose to go to their uh, hunting grounds on the Belly River and where their present, present day reserve is. And so this lands they chose for themselves. And the Bigani were always in the area, North Bigani were always in the area that they had chosen. But then the Sarsi, or the Tutina people, broke off, didn't want to stay there either, and they chose their own uh, reserve. Now, the, uh, what do you call them, the Morley, our Stony tribes, our tribe, they were actually kind of had a place chosen for them by McDougal, where their present day reserve is. And this is where the tribes end up breaking down, just kind of like you see here. That whole green colored area is basically kind of lands given up by treaty. Now, if you look north in, the United, in, in Canada, you can see that's mostly Treaty 7 lands there. But then even more than Treaty 7 lands. And then if you go down into the south, you can kind of see some of the Blackfoot lands that were whittled away by the American government. And then you see inside of the green, those yellow markers. Well, these are the reserves that were kind of what is basically how the Blackfoot broke up and how we ended up on the different reserves that we live on now. As you can see up north there, that's the Siksika Nation. Well, at that time, it was double the size. That one is kind of like our present size, but at that time, during the signing of the treaty, it was double the size after 1883. Because this is when they chose the different reserves in 1883. And this is how all the Blackfoot people end up settling throughout that their once huge, vast territory. Now, if we look at the next image, here's the Siksika Nation after 1883. And you can kind of see there on that uh, dated, it's actually dated 1883. So this was the how they kind of drew out Siksika. Now the Bloods have already left, they got their own uh, reserve now, and same with Bikani and same with Tsutinna. So this is the land that was left to the Siksika people. And you can see the top part of there, this is kind of where present day Siksika is. But if you look at the bottom part, now this is all. <laughs> point the wrong way this is this was the border at one time of the Siksika nation but when they were kind of uh, encouraged to sell their land they lost this huge portion of land that goes straight across so you young kids and people who are looking at this you got to remember this 
was the Siksika Nation Reserve. This was the land that we were, um, we're actually discussing even today. And we're talking about this 1910 land surrender. Well, this was the original Siksika Nation. And then after that surrender, it was whittled down quite a lot. And illegally, that was illegal too. Uh, that was an action by the Indian agent at that time. So actually, let's move on to the next image. So in 1883, that's when Chief Crowfoot, he actually stopped the CPR. So you've got to remember the CPR are building this railway that's supposed to connect Canada from sea to shining sea. And because of the signing of Treaty Number 7, now these lands are basically opened up so that the CPR could put their, their rail line from Winnipeg all the way to the West Coast to uh, British Columbia. Well, as they're doing this in 1883, Crowfoot put a stop to this. He says, no, no, you can't go through here because there was the original agreement. They were supposed to be going about 10 miles north and then going uh, westward. But they wanted to go through, because of the river, they wanted to go through uh, Siksika, the northern part of what it was Siksika. Well, at that time, Chief Crowfoot still considered this all Blackfoot land and he told him, no, you can't go through here. He put a stop to it. So they end up calling Father Lacombe of the Catholic Church who came out and they end up convincing Crowfoot that this would be temporary. This would be a temporary right of way and that the land that they used to put the CPR would be land that they would give, add to the reserve, which they never did. And so this is actually one of the land claims that our people are still working with today. And that's the CPR land claim, which is which is and should be totally separate from the 1910 land surrender and the other claims that we have because these claims all have their own merits by themselves and so our people should get uh, as as much as we can from these different land claims so this is a uh, crowfoot put a stop to the cpr in 1883 then they had to butter them up and they gave money and they gave all sorts of gifts and stuff like that just to be able to go through temporary uh, i might add but that temporary ended up becoming permanent after the death of Crowfoot. So that same year, probably as a way to appease him, they uh, gave him a free ride, him and a few other Blackfoot chiefs, to Winnipeg on the train. I think the whole point of it was to show the quote-unquote white man's strength um, in Winnipeg. And when Chief Crowfoot and the other, Crow, uh, other chiefs went out there, they kind of got an idea of how many uh, not Bequins or white people there were settlers so actually let's move on to the next image so we jump to 1885 well 1885 was a really pivotal year too if you really think about it if we look at that first image this is when the real rebellion ended now the real rebellion kind of started in the 1870s it ended but it was still an ongoing issue regarding lands being surveyed by the canadian government and taking away basically the rights of farmers who had built farms on the riverbeds in the french uh, system they replaced that. So these people rebelled against the government and they were trying to get the Blackfoot tribes to help. They wanted the Blackfoot people to join in this rebellion and add to their strength and, and take out the red coats and take out all of these uh, uh, Canadian forces and basically have their own provisional government. This was the whole point of the rebellion or the resistance. And on May 12, 1885, this is when it ended. This is when the Canadian forces went in there and basically stopped uh, this rebellion from happening. And uh, the Métis, you know, to their credit, they didn't have much as far as ammunition and stuff like that, but they managed to keep the Canadians at bay for quite a while until they ran out of ammunition, basically, and, uh, and people, and they had to surrender. So it ended here on May 12, 1885. Of course, we kind of know the history after that. Riel was uh, hanged himself. The Blackfoot never did join the cause and uh, stayed loyal during the entire Riel Rebellion, but it didn't matter because the government, once this rebellion ended, one of the first things they did, and by a man, Reed, who started it, he is basically the past system. Now the past system, this was the federal government response to native peoples moving from one place to another because they're afraid now at this time you have to understand like even for the blackfoot we didn't go wander around our vast territory anymore because there was nothing to follow there was no buffalo anymore Nini was practically gone so we had no real reason to wander our lands but now because of the past system our people are confined to our reserve and for those young people 
You have to understand, this happened here in Canada. If you were a Native person, like we were, the Blackfoot people, and you're put on your reserve, you have to go to an Indian agent just to be able to leave that reserve. And that Indian agent has to give you permission to leave the reserve. And he tells you when you have to come back. So he decided everything. This man was like a king. He had incredible power over the tribes. And in, even in the Siksika Nation's case, the Siksika people, our Indian agent was no different. He had that power. So if you want to go to the Calgary Stampede, if you want to leave for the reserve for any reason, you had to go to him and get his permission. And if he didn't want to give you permission, you couldn't go. And if you did, you were punished. And those uh, punishments are under the Indian Act. So this is the year that the past system was basically uh, started. Now the Indian agent was, uh, here you can kind of see some of the roles and responsibilities, and I won't go into all of them, but it'll be uh, really, it's kind of interesting to know that these agents had the power over our finances, over rations. So if you didn't agree with him, he couldn't force you, but he could withhold your rations. He could withhold a lot of rights uh, that you have, like moving around, mobility, uh, food, all of these different things was under his power. So he could even choose the leadership. And in an off, often in a lot of cases, even amongst the Blackfoot, the Six of God, this is what the Indian agent did. If he didn't agree with those traditional chiefs, he chose those leaders amongst the Blackfoot that were more inclined to agree with him, or at least see his way. And we had Indian agents who were like this, from Magnus Begg, who was the first Indian agent for the Blackfoot people. And then we had people like Cecil Denny and ex-Northwest Mounted Police. And then we had the ones that actually started taking the land from the Blackfoot people. So remember those names, Markle. Indian agent Markle was the one with Indian agent Gooderham who introduced the whole idea of selling the Blackfoot lands. And these Indian agents, it was part of their job to do this. People don't realize that, but they were working for the government and they were encouraged to tell the native tribes to sell portions of their land. And now what's funny is that uh, under the treaty, a lot of these promises were already made, just not carried out. They didn't want to use taxpayer money. So they figured selling off lands that were supposed to be protected by them was a way that they could make money for the native tribes. So this was a practice that was happening around that time. The 1900s, right up until the 1910 land surrender for the Siksiga people. The Indian agents at that time were doing their best to sell land from many tribes. Uh, they did it for the North Pagan. Indian agent Markle himself, who was the Indian agent for Siksika, did that before he came here to the Pigani, uh, Apatusi Pigani. And then he also did it to the Cree band in Enoch. So this was a practice of trying to get the natives to sell their land. So let's move on to the next image here. So we go to 1886, another pivotal year. And maybe we'll kind of move along here. Well, yeah, in 1886 here, Chief Poundmaker dies. The Cree Chief Poundmaker, the adopted son of Chief Crowfoot. And it's during this time, during Chief Crowfoot's period of mourning, that he actually meets Sir John A. Macdonald, the Prime Minister of Canada. The Prime Minister and his wife were on a tour of the West, as far as the train goes, and they actually wanted to meet Crowfoot. So they stopped in Gleeshin and they came and met Crowfoot at his camp. And at that time, he was in mourning, so basically he was dressed in rags. But they, he still met with the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister and the, his wife were very generous. And they invited Crowfoot to come over to their place. And so uh, it wasn't too long after this invitation that Chief Crowfoot and other Blackfoot chiefs made their way east on their eastern tour. And you can see some of those chiefs here, these Blackfoot chiefs that traveled to eastern Canada. We have uh, Crowfoot there in the middle, and then you can see Chief Red Crow beside him and then his brother Chief Three Bulls just to the other side of him and then there's Chief uh, North Axe of Bikani just sitting down there and I can't quite remember the name of the other uh, man there and then above them you can see the two uh, one's John LaRue, the renegade John LaRue he's got his hand across his chest and then the other one is Father Albert Lacombe of the Catholic Church so together they escorted all of the Blackfoot chiefs down to Eastern Canada where they had a problem with the food, I guess. But let's look at the next image. I think you can see some more of those images here when they're in Eastern Canada. And this, I think, was when they are in Quebec City, where at one of the Catholic uh, cathedrals there. So anyways, we jump to 1890. Now this was a big year for the Blackfoot because this is when Chief Crowfoot 
removed from that image there. This is when he died, April 25th, 1890. So the great chief Crowhood, it was basically, we call him great. Why? Because it was, even though he may have uh, led the treaty negotiation, ultimately it led to peace. And it's this peace that's allowed our people to survive up until this time. So this wouldn't have been possible without Chief Crowfoot. So that's why we kind of have this, uh, we honor him because of it. So it's on 18, 1890 that Chief Crowfoot dies. Now the thing is, there was a lot of promises made by the government to Chief Crowfoot, uh, which they conveniently forgot after Crowfoot passed away. Once Crowfoot died, the CPR forgot all their obligations. They didn't move the train tracks, they kept it. And so they basically owed the 60 got people for that. And, and which actually is, yeah, they should honor their, what they told the Chief Crowfoot before he passed away. So anyways, in 1905, that's a big jump. And there was a lot of stuff that happened between 1990, the time that Chief Crowfoot died, right up until 1905. But we're going to look at uh, some of these things that touch on uh, the issues of land surrender. So in 1905, now we have Alberta. Alberta officially became a province on September 1st, 1905. Now, there was a bunch of responsibilities that the fed, federal government kept, and then there was some that were allocated or given to the provincial government. And since that time, there, these two governments have been passing the buck because when the native tribes, First Nations, uh, attempt to get something decided, the one government will pass it to the other regarding education and such like this. So this is where the frustration lies with a lot of First Nations today, is dealing with provincial governments and then also dealing with the federal government. So in 1905, now the Blackfoot have to deal with the provincial government because this came into existence. Now in 1907, if we look at that first image, this is interesting. A lot of people don't know who this man was, but Alexander Morris was actually the, the governor at the time of the signing of Treaty Number no. 7. So in 1907, his son, Alexander Morris's son, Edmund Morris, Edmund Montague Morris, who was a uh, basically uh, sort of a rich man traveling. He did portraits and he visited the different tribes that his father had helped make treaty with. And so he would meet with the chiefs. And so on July 2nd in 1907, this is interesting because Edmund Morris, he, he met with Chief Running Rabbit, who was uh, the chief at that time after the signing after Crowfoot died, we had three bulls. And then after three bulls died, they had a problem choosing another chief because the Blackfoot were superstitious. They thought that wasn't a good sign that two big time chiefs should pass away right after the signing of Treaty Number no. 7. So it wasn't until then that two men kind of picked up the slack and this was Running Rabbit. So Chief Running Rabbit was one of the chiefs, head chiefs at that time of the South Blackfoot. And he shared that responsibility with uh, Chief Iron Shirt, who was actually a part of that uh, the same peoples in the South Camp. So these are the two head chiefs, and they you see that staff that uh, Running Rabbit's carrying. Well, they both shared that. That was kind of like a symbol of the power, I suppose, of chieftainship. And that was a gift given to them by uh, one of the royal princes who came to visit. Well, in any event, here Mr. Edmund Morris is meeting with Chief Running Rabbit, and it's really interesting to note what is said here. Now, this is Edmund Morris speaking. He requested me to take a message to the great chiefs at Ottawa. All of the chiefs have the same to say. They do not want any part of the reserve sold. The promise was given them at the treaty and if broken will remain as a dark spot in our history. Canada is now in a position to give us compensation for the vast domain required by the treaties, even more than promised. The Blackfoot Reserve is a pick of the land and there are many avaricious eyes fixed on it. Now, this was actually Edmund Morris speaking, but he was um, showing what Chief Running Rabbit and all the other chiefs were saying at that time, 1907, that they didn't want any part of the reserve sold. And the reason why they're saying this is because by 1907, Indian agent Markle, as I mentioned, was already doing this. He had already, by 1907, had sold a piece of uh, Bikani here uh, near Brockett. And so all the other Blackfoot would have known of this. And so a lot of them were totally against this land surrender. Let's move on to the next image. So in 1909, here we have Edwin Morris again. And now this time he's talking about 1909, what just happened in 1907. 
When the Pagan chiefs came to see me this time, their minds were greatly troubled, as the Inspector Markles arranged to sell by auction a portion of the reserve near Brockett on the CPR. Nothing could be done without the consent of the majority. But hear this, you know, hear this and kind of realize this is what an Indian agent can do. He could, he could manipulate things to suit his, his advantage. Now, numerous meetings were called and the majority always opposed. After a time, the chiefs and their following grew weary of being continually asked to come and a meeting was held when the majority of those present voted for the sale. So they are off to McLeod and will probably employ a lawyer. The present government seems determined to break the reserves. So now we get the idea of how the government's thinking that they want to break the reserves. And this is what this Indian agent Markle did to Pigani. So on the Blackfoot Reserve, Siksika, an irrigation ditch was put through the reserve against the wishes of the chiefs. And now he kind of says, if it was a government work, it would be different, but it was a, a private firm like the Southern Alberta Irrigation Company. And so that's kind of how they say uh, it was a private company that did this, but they still had to get permission from the federal government and the government gave it. So the thing is, this was something that worked against the Blackfoot people. They sold land against their wishes at that time. And this was in 1909. This was two years before the, uh, a year before the land surrender that affected the Siksika. So if we move to the next image, now we come to 1910. So let's see what's happening in 1910. Okay, so on October 3rd, 1910, this is Edmund Morris, and he's come to visit him in this year. And this is after the land surrender. So old chief Running Rabbit has come back from the haying. He has been long too ill to do anything and has given up. I called at his lodge and found him greatly changed. He will soon join his fathers. I am told the surrender of land told on him very much. He, Iron Shirt, and Weasel Calf opposed it strongly, but Yellow Horse and others carried it against their will. He says little, but broods on it. So at this time, this was not just no small issue. Like a lot of people should understand, this was a huge issue amongst the Blackfoot people. And the majority of the Blackfoot people were against any sort of land sale, land surrender. But there was a group in there, and that's not anything against them. But this group figured that if they did get some of this extra wealth that could be coming from the land sales, then they can get the machinery and the farm implements and all the things that they needed to be able to start farming. And this was uh, one of the things that Yellow Horse wanted. He wanted the people to become a little bit more uh, self-sufficient. And if this would help, and then he was for it. But you have to understand that was the climate back then, the political climate of our people, even in this time, that there was a majority against the land sale and then those people that figured they could benefit the people. Well, this is the part of the Indian agent. Of course, by this time, well, let's actually move into, uh, let's look at the next image. Now, Hugh Dempsey, who's pictured here, he actually, uh, he writes, Dempsey describes the surrender of land. <clears throat> A major change in the life of the Blackfoot occurred in 1910, when they were encouraged to sell part of their reserve. The first sale consisted of lands for putting in an irrigation canal through the reserve and later in 1910 for a railway line to Carsland. By this time, hundreds of settlers were pouring into the West. The best lands were taken up by the homesteaders and people began looking at the vast acres of unused lands on various reserves. So as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't just the Six of God, it was all the different bands and people were looking at taking pieces of those lands because they're all prime lands. So because of the Indian population had been decreasing through disease and poor health conditions, many believed the Indians should sell their excess land to settlers. So this was the mentality of the day amongst non-natives, amongst uh, the dominant society. They wanted the native peoples to sell off their lands. They figured they're not doing anything with those lands, we should sell it. So if we look at this map here, this is what ended up happening. This was what uh, uh, Markle and Gooderham went to the chiefs with. And they kind of already drew out this map. They already knew what they wanted to do. And that air, that, that portion of the reserve that's bright yellow, this is the present day Siksika Nation. But if you look at that area that's kind of brownish, just south of it, this is all the land that was surrendered. This was all the surrendered land. And one part was sold at one point and the next one was sold at the other point. But they made millions off of this land. And you have to understand, this was not the reserve, the people, the Blackfoot people's will. This was brought to us by the Indian agents. 
and a few that agreed were chosen as leaders and their signatures were put on this. And this is the power of the Indian agent. Those traditional leaders of the Siksigal were ignored and the ones that they chose were the ones they chose as leaders that basically approved this. But this was uh, something the majority of Blackfoot people did not want. So if we move on to the next image, I'm going to quote a little bit about, uh, this is George Gooderham, who was actually one of the Indian agents for the Blackfoot people. And it was actually his father who was part of this 1910 land surrender. And so here he has a, an insight as to what actually happened during that time. So he writes, two very unusual things transpired on the Blackfoot Reserve in 1910. A large irrigation project had been promoted by the Honorable J.D. McGregor to bring much needed water into the southeastern parts of the province of Alberta. While water was to be taken out of the Bow River at Carsland and carried by a large canal to what is now Lake McGregor, and from this to be distributed over thousands of acres in the southern eastern corner of the province. The shortest direct route from the dam went through the Blackfoot Reserve, and the company applied for the purchase of land for a canal which the Indians were glad to approve. The route of that canal has changed very little from that time to the present. So this happened in 1910, the canal from Carr's Land to Lake McGregor which the Blackfoot were never compensated for. Now, Mr. Markle could see a bright future for this band if they would sell part of the reserve land and with the capital develop farming on a large scale. Now, you have to understand, this was a promise that was given to our people at the signing of Treaty Number no. 7. Now he's re-promising it to the Blackfoot people. To this, he would add the assurance of food and shelter and to these starving people all to be paid from the income from the sale of the land. This was something entirely different from anything that had ever been suggested on behalf of any band of Indians in Canada. So this was new because it was a ripoff. This wasn't supposed to happen. This was actually totally illegal. But this Markle and Gooderham were encouraged to approach the Blackfoot people to surrender that land. Now, aside from the coal mining on the southern part of the Bow, the Indian made very little use of the large fine prairie land south of the river. This area was often swarming with cattle of nearby white ranchers who paid no rental, but from time to time would give an Indian a steer, and they succeeded in using the Indian property and the band got no benefit from it. So this is their justification, their reasoning for selling this land, is that other people are already using it and benefiting from it, but uh, the band doesn't benefit from it, so you guys should just sell that land, you guys don't use it. And you guys are dying off, your population's getting small, uh, you really don't need it. So this is uh, how they are approaching the Blackfoot people. And here again, you can see that portion of land that was sold off, that was auctioned off by the Indian agent and by the government of Canada on behalf of the Blackfoot people, particularly the Siksika people. So here you can see in the dark portion, as I mentioned, this is the 1910 land surrender. These are the lands that were affected by it. So Gooderham, he goes on to say, when Mr. Markle and my father brought the idea of selling a block of about 100,000 acres up to the band council, they were very interested. In short, it was called a surrender agreement, which stated that the land would be sold at public auction and the money from the sale go into a trust account from which various things would be paid for. Now, each member of the band would receive a pound of meat and a pound of flour each day with tea and other foodstuff. These commodities would be theirs, quote, as long as the river ran and the sun shone, unquote. So basically he's making promises to the Blackfoot people that were already made at Treaty Number no. 7. And by this time, it was almost like, uh, what was that, 40 years after the signing of Treaty No. 7, the, the Canadian government still wasn't carrying out their promises made at the signing of Treaty. So they still weren't doing what they were supposed to for the Blackfoot people at that time. So a set of um, so basically what would happen is the Blackwood people were also promised at this time a set of farm buildings would be built for prospective farmers and necessary implements and equipment would be supplied. Instructors would be employed. In fact, everything that was necessary to make a thorough farming project would be assured to members of the band. So it's kind of uh, they're promising the Blackfoot farm implements. You know, the interesting note is this same year, the government is actually helping other bands with farm implements. So we would have received the same implements had Gooderham not been our Indian agent. 
but yet it was all a matter of land sale. It wasn't a matter of benefiting the native peoples. It was a matter of selling that land to benefit the province of Alberta. And these who uh, Gooderham was rubbing shoulders with, with CPR people, uh, irrigation businessmen, and all these sort of people who were trying to set up farming in, in southern Alberta during this time, 1910 or so. So it says also, he writes that, after weeks of meetings and a discussion, a vote was taken, and the majority favored the surrender and the sale of the land, subject to the conditions set out by the inspector and Indian agent, and the government gave its approval. Surprise, surprise. So this is how the vote went down, and this is anything that's called in our part. This is all historical document. If we look at the next uh, image here, we'll look at his final kind of words here, Mr. Gooderham. He says, after weeks of meetings and a discussion, a vote was taken and the majority favored the surrender and sale of the land, subject to the conditions set out by the inspector and Indian, and Indian agent, and the government gave its approval. So the area for sale included the land south of the new irrigation canal until it left the reserve on its way south, plus a strip three miles deep to the eastern border of the reserve, a total of some 100,000 acres. The western part of this land was offered for sale in 1911 and the remainder in 1917. At both sales, very good prices were realized. Immediately after the sale, the Blackfoot had a trust account which could be used to carry out the terms of the surrender. So they had to sell Blackfoot land to carry out the terms of surrender. Now, this is George Gooderham, and I'm just going to finish his letter to the Blackfoot. Uh, this was actually an Iglesian call, which used to be a newspaper out of the town of Iglesian. And then they put together a, a book. And it, basically, this man, George Gooderham, tells the story of the Blackfoot people, according to him as an Indian agent, from our origins all the way up until the time that he left, uh, about the same time that the band went broke. It was 1940 or so. But it says, prior to the surrender agreement, times were terribly hard for these people, Siksika, to be followed by a prosperous era in which progress and pride in their way of life was very evident among the members of the band. Then came the era of power, machinery, which supplanted the horse era and the dirty 30s, during which period the Indians lost interest in their farms and found it next to impossible to operate their small farms with high-priced power machinery. This was attempted, but the de debts were greater than they could bear. Then followed World War II and in turn to be followed by a great increase in the cost of everything that had to be purchased. The band fund capital and interest had risen, despite all the current expenses and development in excess of two million. But the income from this was not sufficient to meet all the obligations which were assumed under the, sur the surrender agreement. And the government had to come to the rescue of this band. Isn't that inter interesting how the government came to the uh, rescue of our band in 18, 1942? And you know what's funny? At this time, our people had no power, no control over any spending, any money. This didn't happen until 1950. So by 1942, it's the Indian agent who still controls everything. What's, what's spent on what the government is going to spend on the natives as far as food goes or any of these things. So this is kind of a joke uh, that this is written in the sense that the band had any choice in the matter at all. The band fund, uh, actually let's go back to that last one. I just wanted to point this one out. He says, uh, that he writes that the Indians found that they were not advancing as rapidly as their white neighbors. And in recent years, it was very depressing to know the changed conditions and changed attitudes. So this is what he's writing. Uh, so their foregoing sets out the general history of the Blackfoot Reserve from the signing of treaty until 1946. There are many changes, particularly economically in this period. I am not attempting to find a solution. Dash, all I have attempted to do is record what had transpired in the period up to 1946. I left the Blackfoot Agency in March of 1946 to assume the position of Regional Supervisor of Indian Agencies for Alberta and the Northwest Territories, George Gooderham. So Mr. George Gooderham here knew a lot about the history of the 1910 land surrender as it affected the Blackfoot people. And in the long run, you know what, I, I was trying to find the letter here, I can't find it or at this point, but George Gooderham here, he also wrote that not one cent was spent by the Canadian government on the Blackfoot people during this entire period of time. Not one cent that the band spent it themselves, which is uh, not right because if the other bands in Canada were all getting the same services by the government of Canada, 
60 guys should have got the same, and then our added wealth should have been on top of that. But that's not how the government did it. They used our own funds and they spent it without our permissions, without our knowledge. And at some point before World War II, we were broke. And this was nothing to do with the Blackfoot people, but everything to do with the Indian agent. So you young people, always remember that. It wasn't our Blackfoot people who made these decisions in those days. It was the Indian agent, because he's the only one who had the power. So let's move to the next image here. Now, now here's an interesting point. Now, if you look at the Sixika winter count, the Little Chief account kind of talks about this whole time period and as to what the Blackfoot people were thinking. Not what the Indian agent writes, but what the Blackfoot people were thinking at that time. Sixika Aquins. So I'll start here. Mr. Um, here's the Little Chief account, and it's written Little Chief 2, because there was uh, another one. It says, here he writes, Mr. Markley, or Mr. Markle, talk it over with the chiefs. Well, Yellow Horse and Spring Chief, also Sin Eagle, Calf Bull, Wolf Collar, seemed to like to sell some land to go for farming. Oh, there was a big fuss over all the rest. All the rest of the chiefs were arguing, or were against, not selling any land. You could hear some Indians talking bad to the ones that wanted to sell the land for the benefit of their tribe. So when it was known that it might go into a fight, Mr. Markle put it off for next year. So it was decided a vote would be on. So, you, so even amongst the Blackfoot people back in this day, this was a huge controversial issue to the point where people were almost having fisticuffs. They're only wanting to get into scrap because there's the one side that was totally against the selling of any of our land. And then there's the one side there who figured that selling a portion of it and bringing a little bit of something to help us wouldn't be a bad idea. You know, so this is, this is basically what was going down back in 1910. So let's look at the next image. Now, this six ago winter count, this is the next year. This is then when the vote was actually held. And so it goes under a little chief um, winter count. It says, at the old agency, every Indian was up there to vote. I just left school. I, Joe Little Chief, I seen what was going on. I thought there was going to be a big fight. Some Indians that did not want to sell the land were on horseback, were riding among the crowd, singing war songs, and with their whips in the air, one old man, his name was Bear Hat, he was on horseback, with his whip high up in the air, right in front of the table where they were voting. Was he told these chiefs, yes, you want to sell our land, just because you want to try get some, where you are all very poor, we will not sell the land. We will not sell the land. But after the votes were counted, it was known that the votes were in favor of selling the land. So the same year, the government sold the land for the Blackfoot. It was decided the government would sell the land for the Blackfoot and that they would get a farm, about 40 acres of plowed land and one team harness wagon these were to be paid for in five years' time. They also got a house, a barn, and also a ration. Seven pounds meat, three pounds flour, one pound tea once a month. Well, here's the interesting note here. This was by the Father Leon Doucette, who was a Catholic priest at the time. He writes, because he was a witness and he was there, he writes, The band has surrendered part of the reserve, 120,000 acres. 65,000 of them sold for $1,250,000. The vote was 68 in favor and 64 against. Then he adds, but half the people didn't even vote. So this was an unfair vote. And you got to understand, as I mentioned earlier, this is what Markle and Gooderham were doing. They were picking days where everybody would show up and the majority would say, no, we're, we're against this were against the sell. Then they would pick another date. And on that date, the majority of those people just happened to be in favor when the majority of people stayed home because this, this uh, actually happened in the winter months. It was cold. And this is when Markle called, I mean, Gooderham called this uh, meeting. And then when 68, of, 68 were in favor, there was 64 against, but there's half the people and the majority of Blackfoot, as I mentioned earlier, were against the sell. So this was uh, some manipulating by the Indian agent that time. And that's how this vote got off. And that's how it was approved. And it was illegal, as I mentioned in the first place. So it's, it's interesting that Little Chief, who uh, documents this at that time, kind of talks about these divisions that are happening amongst our people because of this land sale. Let's move on to the next image here. So we moved to 1911. And this is when the auction actually happened. Uh, if you can move ahead. 
uh, one image. It's uh, that western portion there you see where Arrowhead is. This is what it was sold first and they made money and then years later they sold that other portion. Uh, I think it was 1917. And then so basically once again here you see those lands that were surrendered. And today this was uh, this was one one case. So today the government wants the Blackfoot people to deal with all of our land issues all at once because they use this term globular. And that global apparently means that once we decide on that yes, we will accept the money for all the land claims, that never again as Blackfoot people will we be, ever be able to go after our land. And this is not a good idea because as I mentioned earlier, if you've been following this program, from the very beginning, the Blackfoot people have had a problem even with the Boundaries of Treaty Number no. 7. So the Blackfoot Confederacy has a legal case there. Even the lands that weren't provided by treaty, which were kind of ripped off from us. This is a claim. And when you go from there, you go to the Treaty 7 territory. Well, there's a lot of lands there that belong to the Blackfoot people. So we have claims and we should never give up on these claims. Because as I mentioned, if you remember from the beginning, the huge vast territory, this is land that was given to us by Itzapeta Piopa. So this is our land, the land that we're supposed to caretake and look after. And just because signing a treaty has taken place doesn't mean responsibility goes from our people to another country. We are always going to be here. And that's why the Blackfoot people consider that Treaty Number no. 7 sacred, because these are our ancestral lands with the stories and with all the sacredness behind it. And to simply to be given off like a piece of pemmican, as one person once put it, uh, doesn't seem right. So our people, this was a ripoff on our part even then. So today we should be careful how we vote, uh, handcuffing ourselves, handcuffing funeral generations from going after what's rightfully ours. So let's move on to the next image. Here's a present day Siksika nation and you can see it without that extra part there. Now this is how Siksika looks today. But I still think, you know, as a Blackfoot people, we could negotiate a lot of these land claims and perhaps get land back. We never seem to get land back. It's always the government wants to keep the land and give us money, but money is soon spent and then it's gone. And then the more land we give up, the more land we have no more rights to. So here's the present day Siksika Reserve. Hopefully uh, future images of that will be bigger or at least the same. So let's look at the next image here. Once again, this is a 1910 land surrender. This was the lands that were allocated to the Blackfoot people, Siksika people in 1883. So this was to be our uh, reserved lands. And this was protected under treaty, but yet they still managed to find a way to, to sell a portion of our lands. And pretty much we're at the end of our program here today. I just wanted to mention to people we're having some votes here coming up. If you've been following this program, keep keep in mind the history of our people and, and keep in mind that this has always been a controversial thing amongst the Blackfoot people, amongst the Sixiga people in particular, and that even though we're having a vote on this, we should uh, be careful because we could always come back to the table to discuss things. But if we make a decision where we've handcuffed ourselves and our future, generation, future generations, then that's not good for our people, uh, for our future. But anyways, in that sense, you know, I think this is the end of the program. I want you all, we're probably not going to be talking here until the new year. But in the meantime, over this new year period, take care of yourselves. Remember, COVID's still out there. In fact, it's mutating or whatever. So keep yourself safe and keep your family safe. And... We'll see you again next year. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Gator Mutsin. And God bless.